morning. My name is Olga Maitland. I'm the chairman of the Algeria British Business Council. I give you a very warm welcome to this webinar on investing in Algeria. And in particular today, understanding the benefits of the updated hydrocarbon law, which dates back to 2019, but now there are considerable and significant changes <coughs> which will be attractive to foreign investors and indeed partners. Not surprisingly, we have a record number of registered participants, which reflects the importance of this occasion. All of them are major companies. Some are old friends and others new to Algeria, an indication of the rising awareness of this major market. This event would not have been possible without the sponsorship from the UK energy company, Neptune Energy, and our partnership, a very special partnership with the Algerian Embassy in London. To them both, I owe a big thank you. I am grateful to the Algerian Embassy who have secured the high level speakers from Algeria in both the Ministry of Energy, All Naft, and Sonatrack. And we will get an insight into the way the legal and tax regime has been revised to reflect the market needs of today. As you will discover, a much simpler process of onboarding has been devised. And a positive point too, is that there'll be a return to the former production agreements which worked well in the past. But first, who would be more appropriate than to set the scene than His Excellency, the Algerian ambassador to the United Kingdom, uh, Monsieur Abdelrahman Benguera, a good friend to us all. Welcome, Monsieur Benguera. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me at the outset thank you, Lady Olga, and your team for your continuous efforts and dedication to promote the business relations between Algerian and uh, British uh, companies from all sectors of the economy. I also wish to thank all the participants from the oil and gas sectors, and uh, in particular, Mr. Alexander Stafford, member of the British Parliament and the chairman of the Algeria British Parliamentary Group for taking the time to be present among us and also to contributing to our discussions. The new Algerian hydrocarbon law we will discuss today is in fact part of a set of ambitious and large scale reforms being gradually introduced by the Algerian government to further improve the business climate and diversify the economy. Algeria, like other oil producing countries, has initiated a profound reform of its legal and fiscal regime to adapt to the new world energy in order, on the one hand, to improve its competitiveness, and on the other hand, to guarantee the country's long-term energy supply. In order to reach these objectives, the Algerian government deemed necessary to put in place a more attractive institutional legal and fiscal framework with appealing measures aiming to, number one, simplifying all administrative and operational procedures with respect to the carrying out of oil and gas activities. Number two, reduce costs and deadlines in order to remove the obstacles that may hinder the performance of such activities. And finally, and number three, guarantee a suitable return on investment that is acceptable and equivalent to the one offered in other countries. Furthermore, the new legal and regulatory provisions introduced by this law offer A, a new contractual framework with three types of hydrocarbon contracts suitable for different types of projects, namely contracts of participation, production sharing contracts, and risk service contracts. B, a simplified fiscal system that will substantially improve the ranking of Algeria on the average levy applied by most hydrocarbon producing states. C, more flexibility in the conduct of oil operations. And D, diverse ways to conclude a hydrocarbon contract. That being said, I cannot speak of the oil and gas industry in Algeria without reaffirming the importance of the relation of partnership within the Algerian energy policy. And this is due to its importance as a tool to develop the hydrocarbon sectors resources. It remains clear that as long as common interests are shared, partnership is a preferred option in our cooperation strategy. 
With this in mind, Algeria still continues to work to put in place the most optimal conditions for the success of the partnerships option, both on a medium and long-term basis. This implies a good and shared understanding of both partners' capacities, common objectives, and mutual trust. There's also a need for a complementary approach and also a need for a contractual framework which specifies the objectives, the means, the planning, the management method, the control, the good communication, and the performance measurement of the partnership. This law, in fact, reflects, as I mentioned above, Algeria's willingness to create the right environment and to provide all the incentives to, in order to encourage direct investment within the framework of a sustainable development that is mutually beneficial to all investors, be they private, national, or international. In conclusion, I would like to wish success to all the participants, notably to the representative of the companies in search of project in Algeria. They can be assured that they will find in the Algerian institution, starting from the embassy to the Ministry of Energy, to Sonatrak, to ANAFT, and all companies, Algerian companies, all the necessary support and professionalism needed for the success of their endeavors. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. And I must say you have put it so succinctly that the rest of our webinar will follow through with your uh, very helpful words. But I do agree with you, this new setting of, of the uh, business relationship is going to make a real quantum difference. But we will be hearing more from you at the end of the webinar. So thank you very much you. for now. So I now turn to presentations from Algeria explaining the developments of the hydrocarbon law. And my first speaker will be Mr. Farid Ayadi, who's the Mining Promotion Director from Ulnaft. Uh, Mr. Ayadi? I'm Farid Ayadi. I'm in charge of promotion at uh, National Agency Ulnaft. Background in uh, mechanical engineering. I, uh, I jumped on track uh, 14 years ago. And uh, I worked for seven, seven years and then joined, uh, joined Ulnaft uh, in... Uh, 2007, now in charge of, uh, of promotion of the mining domain. Ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues and I would like through the few coming slides to highlight all what is new in Algeria, especially within the new regulation settled, all incentives given for investors, a huge hydrocarbon potential and opportunities offered for exploration and exploration. Algeria has a new roadmap to attract foreign investment even if current tight situation with the pandemic are the big constraint, but we are still working to keep in touch with partners who are already operating in the country. And in the same time, many new foreign partners joined us and expressed a big interest to conduct operation in the upstream. I will try for the first part of this presentation to give you an overview about Algeria upstream activity and the strategy to promote the potential of hydrocarbon mining domain and perspectives of a reliable actor in the region. Algeria, as all of you knows, is geographically the biggest, the widest story in Africa with a hydrocarbon mining domain of more than 1.7 million square kilometers, 94% in onshore and 6% in offshore. Actually, a big part of this area is free. And as you see on the map, we have only near a third of the surface under prospection, research, and exploitation activities. Everyone can notice, as it is shown, that 70% of the hydrocarbon mining area is free, and only 4% is under exploitation. These facts give an idea about what are possibilities for foreign companies to do in Algeria. They can appreciate what a huge and attractive destination is there, and a huge amount of work has to be done in the coming years. The Algerian hydrocarbon mining domain is clearly known to be underexplored. Hydrocarbon potential is also well estimated by studies conducted in the last 50 years, and we continue working on for a better appreciation. Let's give some aggregates. Total production of gas <coughs> around 120 
BCM by, by year, when oil production is 1 million barrels a day. Oil and gas reserves, as you see, are very important and need to be developed in an optimized way in standards of the industry. There are 4,000 BCM of gas reserves in 2P and more than 15 gigabarrels of oil in 2P. Tremendous and conventional hydrocarbon resources are already estimated by an ongoing study, a final sorry, study conducted by NAFT in shale and tight formation in seven basins in Sahara region in the southern part of the country. Estimation of the resource remained in source rocks, mainly in Silurian and Frassian horizons, by a basin model used in the study shows that there are around 900 TCF of recoverable gas and 17 gigabarrels of recoverable oil estimated under reasonable technical hypothesis. Besides that, there is a huge volume of hydrocarbon which are expelled to reservoirs as it is assumed that some of, of them were trapped in conventional reservoirs and tight formation and the other are already discovered. As you see in the table at the right, with a reasonable hypothesis of 10% of trapped volumes, the amount of remaining resources undiscovered are huge. 400 gigabytes of oil and around 4,700 TCF of gas. Exploration activity, activities, a longer period of, of, of 30 last years could be divided, as you see on the chart, in two parts between 1986 to 2005. With an average of 20 wells drilled by yearly, we got an average of eight discovery by year. In the period of time going from 2006 to 2018, with an average of 100 wells drilled by year, we got an average of 30 discoveries by years. This better performance comes from drilling efforts coupled over the period with an important yearly 2D seismic acquisition and significant increase of 3D seismic acquisition from 2013. We can see, as a result, an evolution of hydrocarbon reserves in place with milestones in the bottom of important fields highlighted mainly in partnership, like in Berkeley in 1995, and some big discoveries between 2013 and 2018. Exploration activities identified over the last 10 years many hydrocarbon discoveries of various sizes, mainly of gas and significant volume of oil too in different basins. As it is shown, gas potential is in the West region, in Birkin Basin and Ilizi. On the other hand, oil in, is in Hasim Saud region and Wadmiya. I want you to pay attention to exploration costs by oil barrel oil equivalent discovered in these different basins, which seems competitive in a range between $0.56 to $1.5 for the highest. Partnerships remain the main axis of national energy policy. Partnerships in upstream is a success story in Algeria. It started with the low 86.14 and continued until now. Unfortunately, attractiveness of Algeria decreased significantly in the last 10 years compared to before. As it is shown by two figures, you can see clearly that exploration and delineation drilling activity was supported quasi totally by national oil company Sonatrack. The situation is not better in development where the trend of drilling activity in partnership is quite similar with a net decrease in the last three years. Let's move now to the situation of hydrocarbon production and its evolution. In the last 10 years, total gas production was on a decreasing trend with a relative stable yearly contribution of gas fields in partnership with foreign companies for around 15%. Contribution of gas field production in partnerships, partnerships comes in a large part, as you see in the graph below, from in Saleh and in Amenas, which are operated by BP and Equinor. It appears that foreign companies are more dynamic and present in oil exploitation, even if total oil production is also decreasing for both fields operated in partnership and those operated by Sonatrack solely. 
As you see, contribution of oil field production in partnership reaches yearly somehow around a half of total production. This oil production is in partnerships come for a large part from fields in Birkin Basin. What is Algeria's strategy to boost upstream activities? Let's review in coming slides through all opportunities offered to partnership and move step by step in, drew, in a drew roadmap. Algeria's strategy designed to boost exploration and exploitation opportunities within the national mining domain area aim to focus on prospection and research in underexplored area, such as the North, the Western Sahara, plat Sahara platform and offshore Algeria. The Algerian offshore basin is a large frontier area and one of 130,000 30, square kilometers located in the southern part of the Western Mediterranean Sea over 1,200 kilometers shoreline coast from east to west. Several works were carried out during previous years, including one deep well, two cauldrons, 2D and 3D seismic acquired. Sonatrack, ENI, and Total are currently in prospecting phase in the east offshore, east offshore basin. Prospects and leads that reaches a size of 400 square kilometer were already identified. There are presence of plastic re reservoirs and thermogenic and biogenic hydrocarbon generated. Estimated volume for prospects and leads are more than 5 100 million barrels of oil and more than two TCF of gas. Algeria offshore remains an area to be developed in partnerships. Algeria aim to, aims to build a successful exploration strategy which requires conducting regional studies of high quality in order to increase reserves. This strategy is based on increasing reserves of brown fields, as it is shown on the right, and in the same time, exploring deep horizon, stratigraphic and mixed traps, like deep reservoirs in Burkine, Gessetweed and Ilizi Basin, and stratigraphic traps in Ilizi. There are also opportunities for partnership in appraisal and development of existing discoveries of oil and gas. Delineation and development of existing discoveries of over then 100 new near fields discoveries are to be developed, like gas discoveries in Ilizi, Berkin, Ahmed, Timimun, and Dergan, with a total amount of reserves P, P2 plus P3 of 118 TCF. Total oil reserve in discoveries in uh, Wadmiya, Amgid, and Berkin are about 8.74 gigabarrels of, uh, in 2P and 3P. Another option to consider is enhanced oil recovery in, mat in mature fields. There are many mature fields which need to be stimulated to increase the recovery of reserves in place after a long period of exploitation. It is estimated that in more than 30 fields, by increasing the recovery rate by 10% to 15%, the remaining recoverable reserves will increase by 7.2 gigabarrels. This technique can be implemented in Wadmiya, Amgid, Ilizi, and Berkin, where, for example, an increase of recovery factor of 13% will more, more than double remaining recovery, recoverable reserves from 1.2 gigabarrels to 2.6 gigabarrels. As a big challenge for the future of, Algeri of, the, of the Algerian hydrocarbon industry, and a straight, in a straight line with national energy security policy, exploration of shale and tight plays in a long-term strategy with profitable exploitation in a safe and secure way for environment and aquifers is another option to boost upstream activities. Main resource rock identified by our study are Silurian and Fricin. Tremendous resources are confirmed by al study conducted with basic front lab. There is possibility to produce particularly gas in Western Basin and liquids in Eastern, Eastern One. National oil company Sonatrack drilled in 2014 two wells in Ahmed Basin as a pilot test 
of frac fracked shale formation, where the production of gas over a period of time was very similar compared to performance of best wells in US Marcellus field. What is new with promotion of new ENP project? Since 2017, Alnoft has adopted the new approach for the promotion and enhancement of investment opportunities through conclusion of study agreements to assess the hydrocarbon potential of the, Alge the Algerian mining domain. Exploration and production opportunities that are promoted under study agreement process concerns many discoveries and fields to be developed near the existing facilities. Significant potential in conventional resor reserves in different fields. New approach for tight oil and gas reservoir development fields. New techniques and technologies to improve the recovery factor in mature fields. The purpose of this new approach is to minimize risk on the project by carrying out a study before any commitment by the company. Confirm the hydrocarbon potential and the economic viability of the pro proposed projects. And finally, improve knowledge and understanding of hydrocarbon mining domain potential. The, the study convention process includes a brief presentation to international company of E and P projects in the first step, and then a data room is organized to appreciate quality of the data and get an overview of the potential. If the interest of the company is expressed, Alnaf give all the data available for free to the company to conduct a study after signing a study agreement. In case the study confirmed the potential and profitability of the project, Alnaf assist the company to get a contract. Until now, and under this process, 10 oil and gas development projects are proposed. 21 study convention were signed with foreign companies since 2017. Seven studies are already finalized. Three E and P contracts were signed under this process with ENI in 2018, and production started nine months later. Many other contracts are, are now under discussion with international companies on different opportunities. In a way to improve knowledge and understanding of hydrocarbon mining domain and estimate the potential, three integrated study in different basins were launched. A study of unconventional of tight of potential of seven of first basin of Sarara jointly con conducted by Anoft and BC Fund Lab is already finalized. Four international companies, ExxonMobil, ENI, Total, and Equinor are associated to follow this study and bring their experience and know-how in development of export and exploitation of this kind of resources. Two other regional integrated studies are also ongoing, and it concerns the potential of Hodna basins and Miller and northern part of Berkin basin. Multi-client projects is another, is another way for promotion. Multi-client study conducted by Basic Forlab is available to purchase. This project is based on unconventional potential study results. It consists on a petroleum geological synthesis of Triassic and Paleozoic level of Sahara platform. It is a construction of and provision of right to use the result of study under Argis format. This Argis solution is available to, for, to purchase. At the same time, a call for in manifestation of interest was launched in 2020 for carrying out study on the petroleum potential of basins and a joint commercializ commercialization of data, results, and their interpretations. Three companies are selected and contracts are under discussion. Just notice that multi-client project process is still open to a specialized company for submitting an offer. Alnaft Agency is in charge of management of all data generated by exploration and, pod and exploitation activities on national mining domain. ENP National Data Bank stores and manages more than 12,000 dwells, 670,000 kilometers of 2D seismics, 180,000 square kilometers of 3D seismic, and 500 kilometers of cores. 
UNLAF's National Data Bank is also certified ISO 9001. UNLAF users run the National Data Bank services to, to accomplish their missions by logging through an internal portal. External users will shortly have access to the National Database external portal, which is being procured. Thank you for attention. Now I'll give the floor to my colleague for the next part of uh, the presentation. Thank you very much indeed for giving a very exciting uh, view of the opportunities in Algeria. 70% of your possibilities are still uh, awaiting exploration and production. The opportunities are immense. And I think it was extremely interesting to hear about your activities on the offshore, the enormous amount of work you're doing all around the country. And I was also interested to hear you mention about your interest in shale, which I realize is in early days. The opportunity in Algeria means that your door will be very busy with people coming in to see you. Now, thank you for now, but I'd like to turn to uh, Madame Noor El Huda, uh, who is a lawyer at Allnaft, and she will discuss the legal implications. Um, Madam, I give you a very warm welcome, and it'll be a pleasure to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Lady Olga. I uh, represent myself. Uh, my, myself is uh, Bukhari Nonhuda. Is a uh, I am a legal at uh, Anof, and uh, I will uh, present to you the hydrocarbon uh, law, an overview of the uh, about the uh, new Algerian hydrocarbon law. As we all know, since December 2019, the hydrocarbon activities are governed by the new law number 1913 of December 11, 2019, and its executive orders. About uh, 23 executive orders has been published till today, and the others are being approved. As our presentation will show, uh, this new law provides a very attractive fiscal regime and a contractual flexibility. And also it, it covers three important aspects, which are the upstream activities, downstream activities, and HSE, the uh, health, safety, and environmental aspect. Uh, before moving to the three uh, important uh, points covered by the law, we have to uh, explain the institutional organization of the hydrocarbon sector, in the head of this organization, we have the Ministry of Energy and Mines, which is in, uh, in charge of implementing national policies and strategies in the field of energy, including hydrocarbons. Then we have the agencies. Of course, we have UNLOFT, the National Agency for the Valorization of Hydrocarbon Resources, and IRH, Regulation of Hydrocarbon Resources Authority. UNLOFT is a, uh, mainly in charge of promoting the investment in the upstream activities. Uh, it uh, issues the authorization of prospection, issues also the attribution deeds of parameters and upstream concessions. And it, it approves the, uh, the development plans. For the ARH, it's in charge of technical regulations applicable to the hydrocarbon activities uh, regulations on HSE, the environment, and prevention and management of risk measures. Also, it controls the conformity of and quality of petroleum products, and it approves the environmental impact studies uh, and hazard studies. Of course, they are, these are the main uh, missions of these agencies. There are other missions provided by the hydrocarbon law. For the, uh, now we move to the first part of uh, covered by the hydrocarbon law, which is the upstream activities. In accordance to the law, the, hydro, the upstream activities are defined as the activities of prospecting, exploration, appraisal, and exportation of hydrocarbons. It includes processing facilities, compression, gathering system, storage, and expedition facilities and site abandonment activities. We uh, wonder who can carry out the upstream activities. 
uh, the law uh, in accordance to the hydrocarbon law, any person pre-qualified by UNLOFT, whether as a pers- uh, an investor with uh, a person with sufficient financial capacities or an investor operator, a person with sufficient financial and technical capacities or ups, uh, as an upstream operator, a person with technical capacities who is pre-qualified to conduct the upstream operation on behalf uh, and under the responsibility of uh, the NOC and its partner or partner, partners can carry out the, uh, the upstream activities. For example, for the prospection activities, any person holding prospecting authorization can carry out prospecting activities. For the exploration and or exploration activities, it can be carried out whether by a TV between Sonatrack and other companies under the hydrocarbon contract or by the uh, national, OC, national oil company Sonatrack solely under the upstream concession. I am sure everyone is wondering what authorization is required to uh, exercise the upstream activities. For the uh, prospection activities, we have um, the prospection authorization, which is delivered by UNLOFT, and it allows the prospector to detect hydrocarbons using geological methods and carrying out stratigraphic drilling. This authorization is non-exclusive, and it's delivered for a duration of two years, renewable once for maximum duration, uh, the same uh, duration. This uh, authorization can uh, provide some privileges to the prospector. For example, uh, a prospector having carried out uh, prospecting activities on a perimeter or part of it can benefit from preferential rights in uh, around it. And if that happened and the prospector could conclude a contract with the contract, those expenses, I mean the expenses of prospecting, previously approved by UNLOF, will be considered as exploration investment attached to the, the first year of uh, entry into force of the hydrocarbon contract. Now uh, for the exploration and exploitation activities, we have the upstream concession. The upstream concession is delivered by UNLOF and it allows the national company the right to carry out exploration and exploitation activities on a perimeter with initial duration of 30 years. And next we have the attribution deed. Uh, the attribution deed is necessarily attached to a hydrocarbon contract. It's a document by which UNLOFT grants to the contracting parties. Uh, By the contracting parties, we mean national company and any pre-qualified person, the right to carry out research and exploitation activities within a defined perimeter. Now we have the hydrocarbon contract. It's a contract uh, for upstream activities concluded between Sonatrack as a national company and any pre-qualified person for a period of 30 years. This period is split on two periods. The exploration period is for a maximum duration of seven years, and the exploitation period is the 13 years less the duration used for the exploration. We have three types of contracts, the production, production sharing contract, the participation contract, and risk services contract. In the next slide, we will uh, get to know the difference between these three types of contracts. For the participation contract, it's uh, a contract that defines the terms by which the contracting parties exercise the upstream activities within a parameter, and also it defines the financial obligations of the contracting parties up to their participation rates. For the production sharing contract, it also defines the terms by which the contracting parties carry out the upstream activities within a perimeter. But in this uh, contract, it defines the production sharing mechanisms intended for the reimbursement of cost oil and the be- and for the benefit of the foreign contracts. The last type of contract is the risk services contract. 
this contract defines the terms by which the contracting parties carry out the upstream activities within a perimeter and it defines the revenue sharing mechanisms intended for the reimbursement of cost oil and the benefits of the foreign co-contract. As we said, this new law provides a very attractive fiscal regime. As we can see, we have the surface tax, the hydrocarbons royalty, the hydrocarbon revenue tax, the remuneration tax, and the income tax. Those uh, tax are generally paid by the NOC for the upstream concession for the PSC for the ISC also. And exceptionally, it's payable for the, by the contracting parties in the participation contract. We have an exception to the rule. For the remuneration tax, it's payable. It represents 3% uh, of the gross remuneration of the foreign contractor. And it's payable by the NOC, but it's on behalf of the foreign co-contractor. Also, we have uh, other taxes that are payable by the uh, contracting parties as the hydraulic royalty and tax on flaring gas. Now we move to the next comparison done by, uh, by the Wood McKinsey between the uh, fiscal attractiveness in the 057 law and in the 1913 law. As we can see, Algeria, uh, the 0507 law was uh, classified or ranked as an area with high prospectivity and low fiscal attractiveness. But by the, the entry into force of the, Alger the new law, 1913, has shifted to be uh, an area with high prospectivity and high fiscal attractiveness. Also, we have another comparison. Here, this uh, graph represents a comparison between the state uh, share in oil and in gas. As we can notice, the, uh, by the uh, 1930 law, the ARR uh, has, increased, uh, has increased to 50%, almost 3% in oil projects. And in the uh, gas proje projects, it has increased to almost 30%. Uh, the IRR, of course, has increased to uh, almost 30%. This comparison is also done by the Wood McKinsey. Now we move to the next, uh, the second part covered by the, the new hydrocarbon law, the downstream activities. These activities are uh, defined by the new law as uh, pipeline trans transport, refining, processing activities, including the manufacture of lubrificants and the regeneration of used oil and storage and distribution of hydrocarbon activities. I wonder, everyone is wondering who is allowed to carry out the uh, downstream activities. For the pipeline transport, these activities can be carried out by the NOC on basis of a pipeline transport concession De delivered by uh, order of the minister on recommendation of ARH for duration of 30 years. This uh, pipeline transport can grant a free access by third parties to the pipeline transport system through the payment of non-discriminatory -discrimin tariff. Refining and petrochemical activities, it can be carried out by the NOC in partnership with any person and or any legal person governed by foreign law or by the uh, NOC alone after authorization from the minister on recommendation of AIH for the storage and distribution of hydrocarbons. It can be carried out by any person in accordance with the Algerian legislations after authorization by minister on recommendation of AI. The last part, health, safety, and environment. As we all know, uh, the environmental protection is a very important part of carrying out uh, hydrocarbon activities. Therefore, the new hydrocarbon law preserved a package of provisions to protect and preserve environment against damage, against any damage caused by the later to and resulting hydrocarbon activities. AIH uh, takes regulations and directives to or adopt 
standards, standards relating to health, personal safety, industrial safety, and environmental protection while respecting the principle of sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a wonderfully clear presentation and a route map, because without you, the companies couldn't even begin. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure we'll get a lot of feedback on that. Um, so we will keep in good touch and thank you, Madame, for your thank presentation. You. So, yeah, and we will meet hopefully in Algiers, as indeed with Mr. Alayadi. Now, our next, Mr. Khaled Rekush, who is a director counselor at Sonotrack. Now, bear in mind, Sonotrack is key to the whole exercise of engaging with Algeria. Um, all now very grateful for, for the entry point, for the legal advice, but at the end of the day, the relationship is with Sonotrack. So, so Rekush, I give you a very warm welcome. Thank and you. look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Lady Olga. I introduce myself. I am Khaled. I'm a lawyer. I am working in the hydrocarbon sector since 22 years. I was in charge of contracts with Sonatrack. And now I am director counselor reporting directly to the CEO of Sonatrack. Sonatrack has an integrated uh, oil company is present in the whole value chain in Algeria and in international activities. As you say, we have the exploration activities and the production of the upstream. We have also, we are present in the transport system activities by pipelines. And we are active in also in the liquefaction and separation, refining petrochemicals and commercialization or marketing activities. Algeria is the largest uh, country in Africa, and I can see that Sonatrack is the largest company in Africa with a large portfolio of uh, more than 100 national and international companies. More of these are affiliates 100%. We are present in Spain, UK, Italy, Portugal, mainly for the marketing uh, activities. And for the upstream activities, we are in Tunisia, Libya, Mali, Niger, and Peru. Here, Peru, uh, I have to correct this. It is not an exploration block, but it's exploitation. We are producing gas. As we can see, Sonatrack ensured the supply of gas and petroleum products to the domestic market into 22, amounting about... Uh, 60 million ton oil equivalent. It's also delivered to foreign markets in 2020, more than 82 million ton oil equivalent of liquid and gases hydrocarbons. The total investment from 2010 to 2022 are 103 billion US dollar. And as you can see, the main investment is the uh, for upstream activities. For the mid-term investment, Sonatrack plan to invest about $41 billion, representing 84% of the activities of Sonatrack alone and 16% with partners. 70% of this plan is dedicated to the upstream activities. For the transportation activities, Sonatrack operates more than 20,000 kilometers of uh, pipelines. 40 pipelines divided into 22 pipeline transport system for all products, gas, oil, condensate, and SPG. We have 85 stations and 30, about uh, 400 machines, 3 million tons storage, and about uh, 3 million tons of cargo capacity. There is two main hubs, as you can see in the map. For the gas is the, the red one, it's Hasirmel. And for the green one, it's for Hasim Saud. And we have three international gas export pipelines with 52 BCM total capacity. We have made, made gas to Spain, GPDF to Spain, and GM to Italy via Tunisia. This network presents a big uh, flexibility to Sonatrack. 
As you can see here, the natural gas capacity is supplemented by 31 BCM of LNG capacity. Sonatra operates four LNG plants, three in Arzu and one in Skigda. The total uh, capacity of LNG is 50, about uh, 60 uh, million cubic meters of LNG, representing uh, uh, 30 BCM of natural gas. This slide shows the petrochemical activities of Sonatrak. The plants are operated jointly with partners. We can see we have ammonia with uh, SBG, which is uh, an Omani company, and Sorfert with Egyptian Oroscom. We have Helios or Helium with Helap, and we have Helison, mar Helison uh, Marketing and Helison Production with Lindy Gas. We have also Methanol, CPNZ in Arzu, Ammonia, another Ammonia Fertial, and Sonatrak in partnership with the Fertial, Spanish uh, partner. And we have HDPU, polyethylene, and polypropylene with Sonatrak, which is uh, a new project. In addition to its marketing activity, via gas pipeline, Sonatrak have shipping capacities. We have seven methane tankers for the transport of LNG with a total capacity of 851,600,000 cubic meters, nine LPG tankers, and we have two oil tankers. Also, Sonatrak present through its solarization project, which is fully part of the National Renewable Energy Strategy 2019, was marked by the inauguration of the first photovoltaic gas hybrid solar power plant at Berda North in partnership with ENI, ENI, and the signature of two MOUs with ENI and Total for the development of the renewable energies. The total uh, energy solarization is one three gigawatt. Many opportunities can be presented for investors in the upstream activities. We have exploration and development as uh, my colleague says uh, in his presentation. Uh, we have a huge and conventional natural gas potential. And in the downstream, we have the development of the petrochemical industry which is a uh, uh, priority for Sonatrak and the hydrogen pylon projects. Also, we have equipment production and engineering, privileged partnership to invest in equipment production and engineering. Well, Mr. Rakush, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. I was delighted you mentioned the United Kingdom, but of course, we receive at Milford Haven uh, Algerian gas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all our households are grateful to being kept warm by Algeria. But I was also interested to hear your remarks about renewable energy, because UK companies are also putting a lot of effort into that domain. And I'm sure that for a future occasion, we'll be in touch on that. But this is a very exciting panel that we've just had. Um, I hope that we will be able to have the privilege and the permission to circulate your very important slides because there's a lot of important material that came out of this, and there's no doubt about it, I think there will be a very active interest. But of course, when you have active interest, you also need a, other perspectives. How do people really feel about it? How are they reacting? So I'm going to uh, introduce you now to a UK or international perspective. How does the law look to foreign investors? And I'd like to introduce our good friend, Reem Lucif. Reem, you're on uh, silent at the moment. Reem is Algerian. She's based between Algiers and Paris. She works with the LPA um, CGR law firm. And she's going to do an analysis of the hydrocarbon law, the introduction benefits from the uh, investor's point of view. And she will be supported with her comments with a leading British law firm, Herbert Smith. Their office in Paris is represented by Bertrand Montembeau. But in fact, it's going to be Reem now who's going to lead off with the opening remarks. Reem, a warm welcome to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Lady Olga. So to briefly introduce myself, I'm a French lawyer practicing here in Algeria since more than 10 years. And uh, today I will uh, present very briefly uh, the new hydrocarbon law, focusing on, on upstream activities with uh, my colleague uh, Bertrand Montembeau from uh, Herbert Smith in Paris. So um, basically, the new hydrocarbon law was published on uh, December 11th, 19, and is aimed at stimulating foreign investment in Algeria's oil and gas sector. Today, more than half of the implementing text have already been published. Now, in terms of existing hydrocarbon contracts under former laws, they shall remain in force and grandfathered by the former laws until their initially agreed term. And then they cannot be extended or renewed beyond that term. So regarding uh, the exploration and exploitation contracts governed by former law 0507, they could opt to move to the new law if no production had started prior to the 24th of February 2013, and if the request for migration was made prior to December 23rd, 2020. And practice shows that uh, certain contracts migrated to the new law uh, by the end of last year, but subject to the upcoming implementing text because at that time, the implementing texts were not published. So now um, I would like to, to ask uh, Bertrand whether you have any comments on the transitory provisions provided by the new law. Thank you, Reem. Um, as you know, the application of new laws to existing contracts uh, often gives rise to difficulties. With the Algerian new law, I think we have a clearly well-drafted transitional provisions. Uh, I know that the principle of legal predictability is well preserved, that the application of the new law is an option for the holder of existing contract. Um, that option is, of course, subject to certain condition. And uh, I also note that the application, the immediate application uh, of uh, certain provisions to uh, the existing contracts is uh, limited to uh, very well identified areas of law like uh, health and safety environment, which is very consistent with international practice. Uh, there is also some uh, uh, provisions about abandonment and decommissioning, uh, which if I understood correctly, uh, are also immediately applicable to uh, the contracts governed by the 0507 law. So uh, just to keep it short, uh, that key aspect of a new law is for me uh, uh, very satisfactory. Uh, when I'm reading that, I think it's uh, extremely well uh, drafted and precise. Over to you, Ray. So now we, we can move on to the next slide uh, regarding the benefits of the new hydrocarbon law. So as explained by uh, Sonatrach, Alnaft um, and the ministry, um, today the new law is generally more precise, simpler and more flexible with regard to um, the types of contracts available uh, with regard to the method of awarding such contracts and the applicable petroleum tax regime. So on the first point regarding uh, the more flexible contractual framework, today you have basically three types of hydrocarbon contracts, the partnership contract, the production sharing contract, and the risk services contract. And uh, what we note today is the return to the successful production sharing system that existed in the previous law of 1986 
and that resulted in the large hydrocarbon discoveries and the successful development of the Berkin hydrocarbon basin in the 90s. So now, um, Bertrand, maybe uh, you, you would like to share with us your views on this new Algerian legal system compared to what you've seen in other French jurisdictions. Yes, thanks, Ray. Uh, maybe, uh, of course, it's a, it's a bit challenging to make uh, some general remarks in a short period of time, but uh, maybe just a few brief uh, remarks on the uh, Algerian uh, hydrocarbons legal system compared to what uh, I see in other jurisdictions uh, based on the French uh, uh, civil law system. Uh, I would say that the Algerian legal system is uh, different in uh, many uh, respects. Um, and if I may, uh, maybe I would uh, just uh, mention three of them. The first one, which is probably the most obvious, is the uh, 5149 rule, which, uh, as everybody knows, has been maintained in this law. Um, of course, in other jurisdictions, you also find uh, sometimes provisions uh, providing for a statutory uh, minimum participation of the state or the national oil company. But uh, it's quite um, rare to, to, to have a threshold of more than 50%. The second aspect, which I would probably mention uh, when I think about what I see in other uh, French speaking jurisdictions, is the, uh, the institution, institutional organization, which uh, uh, has been brilliantly um, exposed by uh, Madame Boukhari. Uh, that uh, institutional framework in Algeria is, uh, I would say, a bit uh, sophisticated. Uh, instead of having just the state and the national oil company, which we would uh, find probably in most uh, French-speaking jurisdictions, you have, in addition to the state, these two um, uh, independent uh, agencies, uh, meaning that uh, unlike what you would find in most uh, French-speaking jurisdictions, uh, investors do not have any direct uh, contractual relationship with the state, and uh, that might have an impact uh, in particular in terms of the uh, guarantees which might be uh, uh, provided uh, to the investors. Uh, the last point I would make, uh, Rim, uh, may, may very briefly, and once again, that has been uh, very uh, well presented by Madame Boukhari, is the typology of contracts. Uh, Heath uh, risk service contract and uh, production sharing contracts are, uh, of course, common forms of hydrocarbons, which you would find uh, in, uh, in many jurisdictions. The concept of participation contract is probably something which is more uh, peculiar to the uh, Algerian legal systems. Uh, when I looked at uh, the provisions about this participation contract, I had the impression that, in fact, it was more or less trying to achieve what you would uh, have under a concessionaire uh, system in other jurisdictions, if you look at the legal and tax regime of that contract. But of course, because in Algeria, the mining titles are held by the state, uh, you, you can't have a pure uh, concession system. So that would be my, uh, some general remarks about the uh, uh, legal system in Algeria. Thank you very much. So the, the second point uh, with the new hydrocarbon law is uh, the introduction of a preferential tax uh, regime. Today, it's possible to benefit from a preferential tax regime if certain conditions are met. So firstly, if the perimeter presents a complex geologi geological situation, or if there are uh, technical difficulties in extracting hydrocarbons, or if uh, they are uh, compl uh, if they are very high um, development or operating costs, which may compromise the project's economy, then reductions in the rates of the hydrocarbon royalty and the hydrocarbon revenue tax may be applied in order to achieve a reasonable economic 
profitability. And this is a very pragmatic approach that is uh, taken here by uh, the new law. And uh, recently, in May uh, 2021, uh, we had the publication of a decree which defines the terms and conditions um, of the procedure in order to benefit from these um, reduced rates. So maybe Bertrand, would you share with us your experience regarding investment incentives in other jurisdictions? Yes, Rim, uh, there would be a lot to say. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it's not easy to make a, a general remark on that. Uh, uh, this is one of the key challenges uh, all uh, oil and gas and extractive in, uh, legislation has to, uh, to address because you, you have a gap between the time when the legislation is adopted and the time when it is uh, applied to a sector. So the state of the industry, of course, uh, evolves between the two. And uh, the question is to which extent you should allow flexibility uh, in, in that legislation. The only remark, there are a number of ways to achieve that uh, in legislation and contracts, uh, depending on what are the objectives of the state. The, probably the, the, the comment I would make regarding the Algerian legal system is the fact that uh, the um, taxation plays a key role. And uh, if you look at hydrocarbons legislation in general, you are different ways to secure the state's oil rent. It can be taxation, but it can be a share in the, in the production. It can be many things, in fact. And uh, uh, unlike in uh, some other jurisdictions where the, uh, the production sharing system is net of taxes, in Algeria, you, you, you have a taxation on the remuneration and uh, on the hydrocarbons, meaning that if you want to introduce that flexibility in the, in the system, you need to use the uh, taxation system, which the new law has done. So uh, I think this is perfectly consistent with uh, the general um, architecture of the system and, and seems to me quite uh, promising and very encouraging. Okay, thank you. So my last point um is uh, regarding uh, the fact that the new law has um, introduced a far clearer legal framework regarding the transfer of hydrocarbons uh, contract. And here, transfer of hydrocarbon contracts uh, covers both assignment of interests and change of control. And this is, um, I mean, a, a positive uh, development for uh, international investors uh, because uh, they can sell, uh, you know, their uh, assets today uh, easily. And um, there is a, a decree which has been published in March uh, this year, which sets out the rules and the procedures for the transfer of hydrocarbons contract. And it's very clear, you have different sets of rules. The first one applicable to the assignment of interest and the other ones applicable to the change of control. And, and that's a very good point and a positive development because uh, in practice, sometimes, you know, we, we had some um, interpretation issues and today I think it won't be the case anymore because it's really clear. So maybe uh, Bertrand, you have uh, an opinion on the rules applicable to transfer of contracts? Uh, Riemann, once again, I agree with you. Uh, you know, these uh, provisions are, are quite uh, well drafted and they are in line with the general trend uh, observed in uh, many jurisdictions, uh, which uh, consists, you know, of aligning the tax and legal regime of uh, uh, share deals to the regime applicable to asset deals. Uh, and that um, trend, you know, is something which, uh, once again, gives rise to some legal issues, because what you're trying to achieve, in fact, is to to impose some obligations uh, on the uh, local entity or the entity subject to local law uh, to some obligations relating to transactions which are taking place abroad. Uh, so that legally speaking, it's not something which goes, uh, which is easy to, to, to achieve. So um, I would say uh, once again, that uh, what you have described, uh, Reem, in terms of uh, the provisions of the law uh, supplemented by the uh, uh, implementing decree are very satisfactory to me. They are very clear. Uh, there is a distinction between the uh, transfer of assets 
uh, versus the change of control. And I think it's important that the two regions are different and because uh, they, they, do not, uh, they, they do not address the same issues. So uh, I think it's once again, well, well drafted. And I think even, you know, critical issues like ta hostile takeover beats, for example, uh, could be uh, well addressed by uh, the system. I have not thought carefully about that, but it seems to me it works. And this is often something which is problematic in other jurisdictions. So uh, it's a very good set of, pro of provisions for me. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you very much indeed, because I think both you and uh, Monsieur Bertrand Montembeau set out very clearly the benefits from the new updated hydrocarbon law the fact that it's going to be more precise, more flexible, more clarity. The new tax regime is critical and um, a much clearer framework. And I think all these points are going to be very important as Algeria moves forward. But I really would like to thank you both for setting out the benefits from the investor's point of view and boiling it all down. So thank both of you very much indeed. And I look forward to hearing from you more in our conversations. So uh, we will now move on to a panel discussion. We have a very distinguished panel taking questions in Algiers. We have Monsieur uh, Samir Bakti, who is with ULNAF. He's a member of the executive board. He's the director of exploration and production. So Mr. Bakti, may I just address a few questions to you? How optimistic is Allnaft concerning the next bid round? Are you getting any indication of a response? Yes, yes, thank you for the question. Just want to be clear on this. We are optimistic and we believe that we can conclude contracts before the end of this year. But to be clear, this new law, this new law provides many advantages. And one of these advantages is the flexibility allowed in concluding contract process. With this law, there is two ways, two different ways to conclude contract. We can go through the bid round and we know what is the bid round. And also it's allowed to get one-to-one -one discussion with interested companies. Our strategy includes these two ways because we aim to conclude contract before the end of this year. And we have strategy which include these two ways to getting a contract. We have set work group, which is assigned to identify perimeters for the bid round, and also setting planning or schedule the planning for this bid round. And this planning, you agree with me that it will uh, depend on the sanitary situation with the pandemic, linked to the pandemic, and also to the economic global conditions. And in parallel, in parallel of this process, this task force is working on the bid round. And in parallel, as uh, explained in the presentation or as presented by my colleague, Mr. Ayadi, we are conducting some studies with some companies, companies who are interested by investing in Algeria. In the beginning, we just present opportunities to the companies and we can, after that, after signing a confidentiality agreement, provide all the data for the chosen region. And after that, if there is any interest from the companies, they can submit a program. The program, it can be an exploration program, appraisal program, development program, if there is any discoveries in the region. And Alnaft is committed to support them to getting a contract on the chosen region. This is the second way also to getting a contract in Algeria. To summarize, we are optimistic that we will sign contract before the end of this year using this new law but as i have explained the bid round depends of on an external condition but we are running the two process 
in the same time. We are open to the one-to-one -one discussion and also we are preparing our bid draft. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. So um, I'm encouraged that you have such a good take up already, but I think you probably will have more. So I was just really wondering whether you could uh, explain to me, will the ONAFT sharing agreement now be ready? I take it it must be. Perhaps you might combine that uh, answer with whether ONAF will now go in for one-to-one -one, uh, discussions with the companies or you have a bigger protocol, a, a bidding round. How do you do it? Yeah, the, the sharing agreement, the template is ready. Is ready. We have prepared the template for the bid round. And uh, we are also ready to show our uh, BSC template, the production sharing contract template, to the companies who can propose any work program, any workflow on any chosen perimeter, and to discuss the different conditions. As you know, the production sharing contract includes a production sharing formula, which is the main thing I, uh, I think inside. And to set this production sharing formula, if there is a bid round, I think we will put some bidding uh, factor inside. And if it's one-to-one -one discussion, we can show all the condition directly to the company, interested company, and we can negotiate. And the negotiation will be held between mainly Sonatrack mm -hmm. and the company. Alnaft will support these discussions, and Alnaft will also, as you know, the contract to be, uh, in fact, they need an attribution deed delivered from Alnaft, and also this attribution deed is, uh, the template is already done, already re ready to show, but we have two kinds, one for the bid round, which is under, in progress and the process, and the second one, we prepare it for the one-to-one -one discussion, and it depends what the company proposes. If they want to go for the prospection, uh, uh, sorry, for exploration and development, we have template. If they aim to develop directly, for example, if they choose a brownfield, we have another template. It's 3D, we can show it, and uh, just uh, create the occasion to, to come to see us and to let us show you these documents. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Bakti. Um, I have a feeling your door too is open to everybody. Um, certainly it's very encouraging the way you want to move forward. And I think next year, 2022, will be extremely lively for you. So be prepared. Thank you. To our next panelist, uh, Mr. Amin Ramini, who is at the Ministry of Energy and Mines. He's the Director for Development and Conservation of Hydrocarbon Resources. Um, Mr. Ramini, I was wondering whether you could tell us in which way do you see that the law is more attractive than the older version? Yes, thank you for, the, for, uh, for your question. Algeria, like uh, other oil production countries, has initiated the reforms uh, of its hydrocarbon law in order to improve its competitiveness, increase partnership investment in exploration and production of hydrocarbons, and maintain Algeria's role as a reliable supplier, particularly in natural gas. And finally, guarantee uh, the country uh, long-term energy supply. And to improve uh, its attractiveness in the field of hydrocarbons, Algeria is proposing a new framework which, may, with, which mainly offers a new contractual framework uh, with, with the three types of hydrocarbon contracts mentioned by different colleagues uh, and simple taxes. I would like to clarify that the attractiveness of this new law should be measured with what other countries with similar characteristic in terms of potential can offer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
What do you see is the principal purpose of the revised hydrocarbon law? I can understand you want to attract more investment. Perhaps you could give it in your own words. Yes, especially uh, more uh, more flexibility in the uh, in the contractual framework and the more attractiveness for the tax system. I think both those points are going to be very important. Um, Mr. Ramini, thank you very much indeed, because we have another speaker from the Ministry of Energy and Mines, Mr. Amir Ali Amir. Um, are you there, sir? Yes, you are. Um, I wonder whether perhaps you could tell us, when does the law actually become applicable? Is it already live or are we waiting for later in the year? Thank you for this question. I would say that uh, in accordance uh, with the Algerian law, the promulgated laws uh, uh, come into force uh, on the day of uh, their publication in the, the official Gazette. But however, uh, some, uh, some provision uh, of the new law, of, of the new hydrocarbon law, need the implementing decrees to be, to be applied. All the, the application decrees was uh, already finalized and ab- approved by the government. We have now uh, uh, 23 decrees published and uh, two other uh, ministerial decrees uh, published also. And uh, the, 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 the remind will be gradually published over the next, uh, next few days. So we're, we're talking about a lot of activity going on right now. And I take it that once the new uh, government is in place, you will be able to accelerate the permission through the parliament. No, uh, uh, the, 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 all the decrees are already studied and approved by the, the, the government. And uh, uh, the process of publication are ongoing, of uh, publication are ongoing. OK, so it looks as if you're getting moving fast. Wondering if you could just clarify one point. Will this law be the same for offshore and unconventional resources, or is it going to be purely for the immediate hydrocarbons? The new law, uh, the new hydrocarbon law cover the entire mining, uh, mining field of uh, or type of hydrocarbons, onshore, onshore, as well as all other type of, uh, of hydrocarbons. Uh, like uh, said uh, by uh, our colleagues, uh, the law take into account uh, specificity of uh, project, and for example, uh, the reduced rate uh, uh, of the hydrocarbon royalty and the income tax uh, may be guaranteed to allow a project uh, to achieve a reasonable uh, economic return, if at least uh, the situation appear like a complex uh, ge- geology technical difficulties in the extraction of hydrocarbon or high development costs. In in addition to this legal provision, the hydrocarbon contracts can can also take into account the specificity and the technical aspect of this kind of project. Thank you very much indeed. Um, We have now a final panelist, uh, Mr. Ali Amar, is the legal manager at Sonotrack. Mr. Ali Amar, if you could say, is the new hydrocarbon law really attractive in your view to uh, foreign investors? I'm just really wondering, in your own words, if you could explain a bit more of your new initiatives. We've heard about the tax regimes, the um, making life easier, to uh, negotiate, that obviously goes through all that. But at the end of the day, you are the controlling factor. Thank you for your question, Lady Olga. I think that uh, the law is uh, effectively more uh, attractive than the, the, the other law. I will, I will just repeat what has been said during this, uh, this uh, session. The, this law is also attractive uh, because uh, it is more clear and uh, more uh, precise and uh, it uh, determines uh, the, the role of uh, the, uh, the different actors in, in, the, in the file. The role of the minister is uh, clear. The role of the agencies 
uh, is clear also, and the role of the uh, the, uh, the operators, the smart track and uh, the NOCs and IOCs are also uh, clear. In my point of view, also uh, the law is real attractive because uh, we we see when we read the law, the law is uh, is uh, clear and it's uh, the state is present but is not intrusive. And okay. I think that it's an advantage for the, in the perspective of operating in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, file. Thank you. Could you please tell me, does the law apply to new investors in existing blocks or does it have to be in a fresh block? In other words, for existing partners who have been in partnership with Algeria for a long time, Will they be able to benefit from the new hydrocarbon law, or is it only the newcomers? The Article Two Hundred and Thirty One uh, is clear on this uh, on this uh, point. The object of law is to attract the, the investors and to maintain the the investor who, who are here. So they can go from the old regime to the the new regime. Uh, and the, the provisions of law uh, are clear on, on this point. But about, about the retroactive, it's clear that when we read the text of the uh, 1913 law, there, is, there are not uh, provisions which uh, imply that she has a retroactive effect and negative retroactive effect. And uh, I would like to precise also that the Algerian Civil Code provides that the law is uh, clear for the, uh, the future and it, it has not a et- retroactive effect. Thank you very much indeed. Thank if you. I may, I might like to open the floor to uh, Reem Lucef and Albertron uh, Montembeau to see whether you have any follow-up questions. Yes, uh, maybe uh, just uh, one question uh, from me. Uh, uh, I've read in, uh, in in the press lots of things about you know the transition uh, issues, and you may have uh, read also the last report from the International Energy Agency, which is uh, which provides for a roadmap to uh, the net zero emission by I think it's twenty. Uh, 50 and uh, their the recommendation is to uh, uh, you know to uh, have a very strict approach to uh, fossil industries I, I was just wondering uh, we were discussing that with Rim uh, and you touched upon the uh, renewable energy where what is the, um, the, the the position of the Algerian authorities and what, what are their reaction I know they, there are some organization like the African Chamber uh, of Energy, uh, which has been very vocal on that. But uh, and Rime, you were also mentioning that in Algeria, there, there were some very good initiatives. Yes, correct. Uh, recently, uh, I read in the press as well that uh, Sonatrac and Sonelgas, that they uh, incorporated together uh, a joint venture uh, to develop a renewable, so that's why that question might be directed, yes, to the ministry, to Sonatrach as well. Thank you. I was just really wondering amongst our panelists, is there anybody who would like to respond? I said in the, the presentation, there is a program uh, strategy of Algeria for renewable energies, and they give uh, a big uh, part in uh, all the activities of uh, mainly from Atraka, as uh, we saw in the presentation, it's a first step. Uh, some mm-hmm. agreements with uh, some partners for the upstream uh, uh, plants, we have to encourage this uh, area, the, the investment in this area. That's very helpful. I had another qu- quick question, uh, Olga, if I, Lydia Olga, if I yes. may. go ahead. Uh, I've read in the press, I don't know to who that question uh, should be addressed, but uh, I read in the press that a lot of MOUs have been uh, recently entered into with uh, a number of uh, foreign investors like Equinor, Sinopec, Pertamina recently, Luca, many, many companies. And uh, I think uh, during uh, one of the presentation, uh, there was a reference to study agreements being entered into as an initial step. I was just wondering 
whether oh. these 30 agreements, which were referred to by uh, one of the speakers uh, initially, were corresponding to the MOUs. And uh, would you, what, what are these MOUs, in fact? Are, are they the uh, a recommended approach to the Algerian uh, authorities? Yeah, I will respond. Thank you for this question. There is ANAF as a national agency which is in charge of promoting the hydrocarbon domain. And also there is Swatrak, our national oil company. Swatrak is signing some head of agreements, some MOUs with companies to try to get in new partnership on some activities. It includes, of course, upstream activity, but it includes also renewable energy, it includes petrochemical, Refinery, I don't know. The study agreement are concluded by ANAFT, exclusively by ANAFT, and it concerns exclusively an uh, upstream fields. The difference is that within ANAFT, we will choose an area and we can provide the data is, I think, more technical, more technical because the HOA signed by Swatrak or MOU aims to getting study agreement, but with Alnaft, we can go, we focus directly on an area. In a brief, in a brief yes. words, I, will, can, I can see that the process of uh, study agreement, mainly uh, promoting uh, projects that are uh, specially related to upstream. How it, how it works, uh, the, we, uh, we, we present the projects to companies, who are interested to manifest, they, they manifest uh, their interest to, uh, to invest. And then uh, we, ma we provide data and give an overview of what is uh, there in terms of work, data, and uh, uh, the amount of uh, uh, work to do. And then uh, the, the, the company will appreciate uh, the potential. And if the interest is there, we can go further in the process and uh, make data available for free to the company. They have uh, access to all the data available in Alnaft data bank. And then if the interest is there, we go to uh, a study agreement where the company will have to do a little work. I mean, uh, they have to do a study and uh, with the workflow previously approved and then if the potential first is there and the economy to develop this, uh, this opportunity is uh, uh, joining the interest of the company, we can assist this company Welcome. and then uh, uh, to go to a contract and uh, implement development plan of uh, this opportunity. That is uh, uh, what is uh, the subject of study agreement, which is completely different from what, uh, what is uh, done with Sonatrack, by Sonatrack, sorry, in terms of signing MU, MOE, which are uh, very global for all the, the, the value of the chain from upstream to uh, downstream. I would like to add uh, some uh, words uh, regarding the, the MOUs uh, which have uh, been concluded by uh, Sonatrack and uh, and its uh, para partners. Those MOUs are related to the perimeters which are operated by Sonatrack. Uh, and the object is to evaluate and uh, appraise the, the perspective and the potential of those perimeters in order to operate uh, them in, uh, in uh, a near future, what we uh, hope. I want to clarify, as when you question Mr. Basli about the one-to-one -one discussion, I can see that there is three ways to open discussion, two ways to open discussion with Sonatrak or Alnaft. And the other way is the bid round, it's clear. But as Mr. Samir and Mr. Ali Amar said that there is maybe some existing blocks which are operated by Sonatrack. All partners, existing partners or newcomers can discuss directly with Sonatrack and they can submit to Alnaft uh, and discuss with Alnaft uh, program work and uh, 
or it depends if it is uh, a new air as mentioned in uh, the question, if it is uh, uh, existing fields, they can go directly with Sonatrack and discuss and submit uh, development plan to Sonatrack. And the other way, it's a uh, discussion directly with the uh, ANAF for uh, the companies which did maybe some uh, studies as uh, it was shown in the presentation. They can discuss for interesting blocks uh, with ANAF and then come back to Sonatrack and uh, uh, conclude uh, an agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for all of you for such an amazing, clear and encouraging uh, panel discussion. Um, I hope we will all remain in very good touch. We're now going to move on to uh, getting a response from a British company who is actively engaged in Algeria. I'd like to bring onto the screen Mr. Philip Lefebvre, who's the Vice President for Neptune Energy for North Africa and beyond. Uh, he is our sponsor today, but Neptune have had a key role in gas production in partnership with Sonatrack, and he will give an assessment of the investment proposition, as I may say, a friend of Algeria. Over Thank to you, you, Philip. Thank you, Lady Olga, and Lady Olga, Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to speak to you this morning in this very interesting webinar. Now, just a very brief introduction, Neptune Energy, is a British company, as Lady Olga mentioned. It acquired, we acquired the French utility company, NG's worldwide upstream oil and gas business back in 2018. So some of you might know NG as Gaz de France Suez. And in the team, I'm responsible for all activity in North Africa and Asia Pacific. And I spend a significant proportion of my time committed to Neptune's assets in Algeria, which is in the Twat field, which is in Adra, Southwest Algeria. Um, now, TWAT is a joint venture with Sonitrack, of course. Um, phase one of that project is now finished and it's on, field came on stream in 2020. Um, after a significant construction program with both national and international companies, including British companies. And now we're getting ready to start the front end work of phase two. And this will again be a major investment for both Sonitrack and ourselves. Um, now, as an investor in Algeria, Lady Olga, as you just mentioned, has asked me to give our Neptune's perspective on the new hydrocarbon law and why Neptune believes Algeria continues to be an attractive place to invest for oil and gas companies. So what I'm going to say really just reinforces a lot of the messages that the previous speakers have given. But I think it, on the hydrocarbon law, it comes into sort of three areas. Um, first, you know, we've heard it's an attractive, what makes it attractive is that you know, that this new law provides for a more flexible contractual framework and a more flexible tax regime for foreign oil and gas companies. That is obviously an, an attraction, number one. And number two, and I think this is the point that Rim was talking about, it in, you know, you, we just heard it introduces the possibility of obtaining tax reductions for development projects that is complex. It could be complex due to geology, could be complex due to technical reasons. And I think this is a very welcome introduction. I think Rim mentioned the word pragmatic approach. Bertrand used the word promising and encouraging. And I, I agree. I think this will create new investment opportunities for Algeria. I myself have seen something very similar introduced in the, by the British government a few years ago. And as a result, it resulted in the successful development of the gas fields all of the west of Shetlands. And in terms of our investments in Algeria, you know, we've started some early feasibility discussions with Sonitrack on the possibility of carbon dioxide in an enhanced oil recovery project at TWAT. And this is an example where this flexible tax treatment could possibly be the element to make such a project economic for it to go ahead. And I think the third point I want to make about the law, new law, is that it's, it maintains the old existing contracts. It grandfathers, I think was the word Rim used. And I'm very happy to see this. This is, this is important for investors. You know, it maintains a security for existing investors who've made long-term investments for production assets, which last decades. And you know, what investors are looking for is they value certainty and this provides it, that's important. And I think the attractions law is, is just to the conversation we just had is also demonstrated by the number of signed agreements and the number of MOUs that have all come up in the last few years. It's a very clear message from the external world, how this external world is now viewing the new landscape in Algeria with the new law. And of course, just to sort of, I got sort of four points of why, why oil and gas companies recognize 
important of Algeria. First of all, as Mr. Ayadi said at the very beginning, it has Algeria has significant oil and gas opportunities to go after. I mean, they, it is, you know, if you're looking where, where there are opportunities to go in the world, you know, Algeria is obviously one of the places with oil and gas opportunities. Secondly, it's got the infrastructure in place already to put gas to market. You know, it is connected to Europe. It's got all the LNG tankers, you know, it's got the LNG plants. It can actually get its gas and oil away. You don't have to go and build an LNG plant somewhere. Thirdly, and we haven't really talked about this, but Algeria is perfectly capitalized, uh, perfectly placed to capitalize on the energy transition that we're having in Europe, you know, because gas will continue to form a centerpiece of the EU's plans for decarbonization. And again, Algeria is perfectly placed to help capitalize on that and, and help EU you know, achieve its aims. And the fourth point is on the new hydrocarbon law. I think this gives people the clarity and the certainty that investors need. And I think it's a good signal from the Algerian government to the oil and gas industry. So just, just to conclude, you know, obviously we very much welcome the positive investment climate that Sonatrack and the government are seeking to achieve. And we see a bright future for the Algerian exploration and production industry. And Neptune looks forward to further developing and for the strengthening its relationships in Algeria. Well, thank you, Philip, very much indeed. And I hope that your message will be warmly received by our friends in Algeria, because coming from an outsider, say Algeria is good for business and the opportunities is uh, very fundamental and very key to its future. And I think also your mention about how we're moving into a clean energy era and how indeed the gas is very much key to that means there's a great future in that direction. So. Philip Lefebvre of Neptune, he's on the advisory board of the Algeria British Business Council. We thank you very much indeed for confirming as an outsider, but a friend, why investment in Algeria is important. Now, I just, I'm just looking forward to getting back to Algeria sooner rather than later. Well, so but am I, I can tell you. Um, we have one final speaker and that's Mr. Alex Haynes, who is the head of business development of Petrofac. Now he's going to look at the future in the energy sector. Petrofac is well known in Algeria. It's a long-standing friend. They opened up their voice in Alger their office in Algiers over 20 years ago and have successfully worked in partnership with Sonotrack ever since. So Alex Haynes will take a look at the future and what it holds. I should also add that Petrofac are on the advisory board of the Algeria British Business Council. So over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, uh, Lady Olga, and, um, and thank you again to all the participants and the hosts for permitting us to speak. Uh, I really have enjoyed this morning's uh, session. I think it's hugely encouraging for Algeria. And as a, a contractor who is committed to Algeria, it's fantastic to have the opportunity to speak. So I hope you can you can see my screen okay, because my intention here is just to very quickly talk about how the hydrocarbon law can provide opportunities um, for the energy transition and to ensure that uh, Algeria can continue to monetize and have good business in sending energy and ideally some clean energy uh, through to, to Europe as, a, as one of its customers. So as, as Petrofac, we've had 40 years of, of oil and gas, and we see the landscape and energy changing uh, by regulation and by design. Many people have, uh, many countries, many companies now have a net zero ambition by 2050. And so in order to continue providing heat, light and power to, to, uh, to our consumers, we, we need to do that in a low carbon or a zero carbon way. Um, and so we've identified these five areas that you can see here on the screen that we're looking at, carbon capture, uh, uh, which, is in, which is going to be absolutely key and critical to decarbonizing and storing that, that CO2 underground. Um, hydrogen, both blue and green. Uh, blue hydrogen is where you take uh, normal sales gas and you split it into the carbon, you store the carbon, and then you have large scale, quite cheap blue hydrogen. And I believe there's a market for that in Europe that maybe can be satisfied by Algeria. And green hydrogen, where you use renewables to split water uh, into, uh, into hydrogen. So you can take solar or wind or, um, or, or, uh, or hydro or something. 
then we have our, our wind sector as well, which we're very keen on. Um, a lot of it offshore for us, but there's opportunities uh, both off, offshore and onshore for Algeria. And then also uh, we're seeing a lot of growth at the moment in sustainable aviation fuels uh, or biodiesel. So taking waste products, uh, whether it's plastics or refuse derived fuels and turning those into biodiesels. Uh, and that's an increasing part of our business uh, using our refinery skills, essentially. Uh, and then also emissions reduction. I think that's going to be key for Algeria um, as you continue to export your energy. Um, there's going to be an increasing market demand for your energy to be low carbon. Uh, and one way of doing that is to capture some of those emissions and, and produce it uh, more effectively. So as Lady Olga has, has kindly said, we've been in, in Algiers for, Algeria for more than 20 years. And as a, uh, essentially as a contractor, we like to design, build and operate uh, the, the assets. And we also like to train the local, uh, the local staff to ensure that we have a legacy in, in Algeria. So this is um, a, a quick map that sort of shows where we think the new energy landscape is. Um, and this is very much a, a European view, but as, as Europe is, is one of your major customers, it's probably worth reflecting. You can reuse um, infrastructure for storage, that's both onshore and, on, and offshore. Uh, you can use solar and wind uh, to, to produce green hydrogen, which you can then export or liquefy um, and export. Uh, and then you can take some, some waste uh, and then turn that into the energy or into, into fuel. And capturing the, the carbon emissions from your power and, and other industrial users will be key as well. So uh, as we've touched on a little bit before and, and Philip talked about the opportunities on, on capitalizing for green energy, you know, and actually in, in line with some of the Sunatrack presentations earlier, huge land mass, huge resource, not just oil and gas, but actually solar as well. Uh, and there's a real opportunity to take, take that solar in large scale and to produce um, hydrogen for export, green hydrogen. We're seeing those projects in Oman, in Australia, and there's no reason why Algeria can't be, uh, be an exporter of green hydrogen in the future. And, and as you know, you have a, a market right on your doorstep that will, will pay a premium for that green hydrogen. Um, the other way to do that is to use your gas and keep monetizing the gas. Uh, by splitting it, storing the carbon and sending blue hydrogen uh, into, into Spain and into, U, into the UK and elsewhere. Um, emissions reduction, the, you know, Algeria, unfortunately, is towards the top end of this list of, of, of um, flaring nations. Um, and that's not only poor for emissions into the environment, um, but actually it's not, not great business. Um, so that if we can find a way to reduce flaring and optimize your assets, um, you can sell that gas rather than, than burn it to the atmosphere. Um, so a quick, uh, a quick little uh, a, a highlight of some of the projects that we're working on as Petrofat. I mentioned green hydrogen. Uh, we've just completed a feed for a large scale green hydrogen project in Australia. And just like Algeria, large scale where you have good solar resource can get very cheap electricity uh, and then can produce green hydrogen at scale. Uh, for export and you can either turn that into ammonia for shipping or you can liquefy it and then send it on just as you do for LNG. Um, a way of decarbonizing some of the operations, uh, you can use solar uh, to produce steam for EOR. And I noted that uh, one of the presentations talked about uh, extending and enhancing your, your oil recovery. Uh, you can do that by carbon injecting gas or you can do that by injecting steam. Uh, and we've uh, completed a feed in Oman, which has a similar issue um, by using the, the power of the sun to create steam, uh, which again uh, increases your production and, and also doesn't increase your emissions. And then a last one here is, a, is another example of, of things that ourselves and others can do is, is flaring, you know, flare gas recovery and, and, and optimizing your, your operations now. This was for um, uh, one of the major IOCs. Uh, where we looked at studies and, and optimized alongside the, the client and we managed to achieve an 85% reduction in flaring. Uh, so that, that massively decreased um, the, the, the emissions, but actually also increased the, the production rates by 2% and there's at no extra downtime. So, so there's some quick wins there which can lower your carbon footprint and actually increase your, your, your value to the company. So that's the end of my... Um, my screen. Well, Alex, thank you very much indeed for helping us to look to the future 
where Algeria will clearly have a very big role in the renewable sector. So that will be another conversation at a different date. But thank you very much. And thank Petrofac for its commitment to Algeria, which is an example yet again of British expertise. So yes. finally now, I turn to um, Mr. Alexander Stafford, who is the chairman of the all-party Algeria British Parliamentary Group. Mr. Stafford, are you online? I am, and I've enjoyed the last couple of hours. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alexander, for being with us. Um, Intergovernment relations are important. This builds government uh, confidence and trust, and in the end, it is government relations between countries which are the key to success from which we will benefit. And so I'm very grateful for Mr. Stafford for being with us today. And I should add, he's already been very active in Parliament in raising the profile of Algeria and making a number of very significant speeches. So over to you, Mr. Stafford. Thank you very much indeed. And it's a privilege to address the Algeria British Business Council today on investing in Algeria and particularly in relation to the new hydrocarbon law. It is also a pleasure to see His Excellency on the call. And we had a very productive meeting at the Algerian Embassy a couple of weeks back. As chair of the Algerian all-party parliamentary group here in the UK, my priority is ensuring that British companies that want to do business in Algeria are supported, particularly in the hydrocarbon sector. I believe there's a huge role for the export of British skills, technology and expertise in energy to Algeria, and we need to seize this opportunity, especially post-Brexit. Many of you will be aware that I champion the Green Revolution and the pivot to renewables, However, as a former employee of Shell, I appreciate how important oil and gas companies are in this measured transition. Oil and gas companies have a huge role to play in research and innovation. And I pay testament to the British energy companies in Algeria doing great work on this already. We know that Algeria's new hydrocarbon law aims to promote investment in the hydrocarbon sector in Algeria, and providing for a more flexible contractual regime and a tax regime more favorable to foreign investors. As you've heard today, the new hydrocarbon law is more precise, a lot simpler, and introduces a more flexible contractual framework. It's more flexible in terms of the types of contracts available, the methods of rewarding contracts, and the applicable petroleum tax regime. This brings Algeria in line with many other French-speaking jurisdictions and makes Algeria, Algerian hydrocarbons more competitive with other oil and gas nations. This is an incredibly exciting development as it grants British companies greater ability to invest in Algerian energy infrastructure and, importantly, to support skills and the local economy in the process. Now, Lady Olga has advised me that I can only speak for two minutes and I'm aware <laughs> that I'm already reaching my time limit. So I say thank you all very much indeed for having me. I think it's been a very interesting conversation. I look forward to working with many more of you in the years to come. Thank you. Well, Alice uh, Stafford, thank you very much indeed voice of the British Parliament and indeed I know there are many plans to get you and your group out to Algeria when traveling is permitted when you get to Algeria I don't think your heart will ever leave it but thank you very much for being so supportive in Parliament so far and your speeches have been noted and this is a very important development so finally I'd like to turn to His Excellency the Algerian Ambassador uh, Mr. Benguera, because it was Mr. Benguera who really spurred the whole idea for the webinar. It was his vision, his drive to get it all put together. And what a success and how much engagement. It's been amazing. Would you like to have the last word of your excellency? Thank you, Lady Olga. Uh, I must say that uh, today I feel like I am 35 years younger because <laughs> the discussion we are having reminded me of the days when I started my professional career as a cabinet member of the Algerian Ministry of Energy and then as head of commerce department with Sonatrack. So these are reminders of the old days. I believe that this webinar has been very fruitful, very useful, thanks to the excellent presentation made by our speakers in Algiers, and also thanks to the feedbacks and comments we had from other part participants. Uh, I think we have today a more clear vision and understanding of the new law, which clearly provides far more flexibility, offers more simplified 
an attractive tax regime brings more clarity as far as the roles of the Algerian actors in the sectors are concerned and offers definitely more choices between different contractual reforms. I should also mention that Algeria has always been a reliable and secure source of energy since its first shipment of LNG to the UK in 1964, that is two days after its independence, all Algeria's supply contracts with its partners have been respected to the letter. Having said that, I believe that British firms, a number of which have been present in Algeria for many years, with their expertise, experience, and capacities, have a great comparative advantage that qualify them to succeed in Algeria. Today, we have a new context and deep changes in both countries. On the one hand, we have the Brexit or the UK after the Brexit that is more than ever turning global. And on the other hand, we have a new Algeria emerging through deep and structural reform, political and economic ones. These new contexts, I believe are excellent opportunities to create win-win and long-term partnerships between economic operators of our two countries. Finally, I would like to renew my warmest thanks to all the participants for their time and precious contribution to the success of this conference. And thank you very much, Lady Olga, and I hope I see you in the next webinar. <laughs> well, thank you, Your uh, Excellency. Without your drive and vision, we wouldn't be all here today and gathered. And although this uh, webinar has gone on rather longer than we expected, frankly, every minute was golden, uh, valuable, and intensive. We've maintained our audience, which is fantastic. So I really would like to thank everyone for taking part, our distinguished speakers in our year, which I was actually with you in the room, and all the registered attendees. Sadly, we couldn't respond to all the questions were sent in, but overall, we've learned a huge amount and also a great sense of optimism, positiveness, and enthusiasm. And certainly I look forward to welcoming more companies coming to Algeria and helping them develop a relationship will be profound and genuine and profitable all around. And as his excellency say, win-win. But thank you all very, very much indeed. And until next time, I say au revoir. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Thank